Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about one of the most rapidly developing areas of science and one with enormous potential to change our future, and that's the science of genetics. I have two guests. Michael Snyder, PhD, is chairman of the genetics department and director of the Center of Genomics and Personalized Medicine at Stanford University. He's a leader in the field of functional genomics and proteomics, which is the science of proteins. He's created a number of new genome mapping technologies and is co-founder of several biotechnology companies, including Protometrix, Affomix, and Personalix. Russ Altman, MD, PhD, is professor of bioengineering, genetics, and medicine, and former chairman of the Stanford Bioengineering Department. His primary research is in the application of computing technology to determine how our genetic traits influence the way our bodies respond to medicinal drugs, which could open the way to much more personalized medical treatment. He's also chairman of the Food and Drug Administration Science Board, which advises the FDA commissioner. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having yeah. us here. Thanks. Mike, let me start with you. Just to begin at the basics, could you say a few words about what the human genome actually is and what's in it? Sure. Your, your genome is your collection of DNA, which is six billion bases, six billion building blocks, if you will. And each of your cells has this DNA. It really is your instruction manual for how you go from a single cell when you were first started out as a a tiny fertilized egg into a human being with 100 trillion cells. Your DNA is what determines that. Does it just code physical traits like uh, height and eye color, or does it have things like personality and intelligence and tangible things? Yeah, it does all of that. It does, again, your physical characteristics like your eye color, um, uh, you know, the, the kinds of food you digest and things like that. But it's also your, many of your personality traits are, are determined by your DNA. They're also determined by environmental influences as well, these various traits. So what's the state of knowledge right now? Can we say that we can look at a genome and look at every gene on that and know what that gene does? Well, this is a huge area of active research. We're trying to understand all the details of how your DNA determines you to become like you, and Russ's DNA makes him come out like Russ, and every person becomes the way they are. But uh, perhaps one of the most extraordinary areas that people are working on is trying to predict disease risk from your DNA. What kinds of diseases you might be susceptible to attain in your lifetime and even things like how long you might live one hopes to learn from your DNA. You know there's a fascinating interplay between your genome and the environment and we're just starting to unravel that. We, we know that as you live through your life and are exposed to external factors that uh, this can modify the way the genetic code gets uh, ultimately interpreted. But we also know that identical twins uh, look identical. And so we know that the DNA has very powerful influences, but that the environment comes in and also does make uh, modifications or some of the choices that need to be made during development. Now, how do you go about doing genome research? Do you take human cells and take them apart with tiny tweezers under a microscope? Not exactly. You. <laughs> Uh, you basically will take, um, for example, your, your spit. You will be able to get your DNA from your, from your spit. And you put it on these incredibly expensive machines. They cost about $800,000 a piece. But you can break it into little bits, and then you actually determine the sequence. And what that means is determining the order of each of the chemical building blocks in DNA. And when you know the sequence, you can see basically how they're ordered and what the difference is from one person to the next, that we have subtle differences. It's only one in about every thousand bases or so that are different between you and me, but those differences make you look like you and me look like me and Russ look like Russ. What are the most difficult technical obstacles to solving um, the genome? What, what is the hardest problem you have to work through to understand what's going on in the genome? You well, know, it used, excuse me, Mike, it used to be that just getting the sequence was a big challenge. Uh, the first ones were solved in around the year 2000 at the cost of multiple tens of millions of dollars. Now you can get your genome for $3,000. So actually measuring the DNA is not the problem. The problem is that gives us a parts list and we need to understand how the cellular machinery reads that and makes decisions to differentiate a cell into a liver cell or into a muscle cell or into a brain cell and then how those cells know when they should do different functions. And that's the current big challenge. 
We have a few slides that might illustrate what we're talking about. Can we see the first slide, please? OK, so what are we looking at here exactly, either of you? Yeah, so at the top is the nucleus where your DNA is housed. So all your DNA is housed in a tiny little package called the nucleus. And the DNA is actually huge. It's, uh, as I say, it has six billion of these bases in a row. But actually the part that encodes the genes, the genes are the things that make your proteins, that make your liver cell your liver cell, and your eye cells your eye cells, and your skin cells your skin cells. We have 20,000 genes encoded in our DNA. It's about 2% of our DNA. And each makes a different protein that makes the different cell types different from one another and, and lets them carry out their specialized function. And the protein is basically the stuff of the cells. That's what the cells are stuffed with, the, the proteins? Yes, these are the, um, the uh, proteins, for example, in your muscles have contractile power, and that's why you can contract your muscles. Proteins in your eyes can detect photons, and that's how you see. Photons in your brain can transmit electrical signal. Proteins in your brain can transmit electrical signals. So they're an amazingly diverse set of what they call biological macromolecules. Macromolecule because they're huge, uh, made out of thousands of atoms and incredibly complex and intricate. Now, do these act like little machines where you press it and it responds automatically, or is there some kind of intelligence going on here? Well, they're machines, definitely. For example, your proteins are what digest your food. The proteins in your gut will digest your foods, and they'll react automatically. But in order to make something complicated like a brain, the proteins really have to be coordinated in their activities so that all the cells in your brain can behave in a certain fashion so that you can think and react. So it, there are biochem it's, all, it's all determined by biochemical activities, but there's a lot of intricate coordination that needs to occur to be properly orchestrated to do the complex things that human beings do. They, they are, um, interestingly, these molecules, they're large, and they are somewhat stochastic. That Every one of them doesn't behave exactly the same because of thermal fluctuations in the cell and the exact concentration of the ions uh, in the cell. Interestingly, in the last 10, 20 years, we've been able to make what we, what we call single cell, single cell and single molecule measurements. And when we look at these individual molecules, we have an amazing ability to see for one protein, what is it doing and how long is it doing it and when does it stop. And these new measurements are giving us a whole new window into the detailed ultrastructure of how the cell works. Is there some kind of regulatory mechanism? Do these genes turn on automatically? Because the genes are a blueprint, but blueprints don't build themselves. Or do they? Mike's the king of regulation. Yeah, I mean, they all, again, have to be intricately controlled so they're turned on in the right cells. So you want, for example, your digestive enzymes to be turned on in your gut and not in your brain. You want your nerve cells and the things that control your synapses that let you think. You want those turned on in your, in your brain, those proteins and things. So you, it's a very complicated machinery. We still don't understand how it works. And it obviously takes not only the hardwiring from our DNA to make this happen, but it also takes the environmental cues that turn things on as well. When you are exposed in an adverse environment, your cells will react accordingly. And, and that's, a lot of that's controlled at the level of your genes. We have some uh, other slides. Can we see the next slide, please? OK, so this is sort of a triangle indicating studies from simpler to more complex. Yeah. Um, do you want me to do this one, Russ? Sure. You, OK, so this is following, actually, it's also information flow. So that's your, your genes at the top. Your genome is your collection of genes. And then uh, function is how they work. And then the next slide is they make proteins. Proteomics is your the study of all your proteins. Um, and lastly, metabolomics is the study of all your metabolites, which are produced from your proteins. So each actually comes from the other, and you go from DNA to making metabolites that basically carry out all the little functions in your cell. So is one of those steps the one that's the main focus of activity now? Do you work on the whole ladder at once, or do you try to pry out the secrets of one? And it's becoming a little bit specialized, but that, that measurement of the genome that happens at the top, that's under control now. That's very digital. It's, we can write it down. It's A, C, T, and G. Those are the four building blocks. And the, you can just write three billion of those down. They can fit on your iPhone or on your music player. That's not a problem. As you get to those other layers, the protein, the metabolome, the transcriptome, what happens is this very digital DNA signal becomes what you might call analog. It becomes a continuous and modifiable. The genome is pretty much the same for your entire life. The transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, those can change from hour to hour, 
minute to minute. So the real action, I'm a physician. The action in terms of what, when I see a patient, what's going to be different is their metabolomic uh, profile or their proteomic profile while their genome remains constant. So it's understanding that dynamic changing environment that is the key challenge right now. And Mike might want to tell you about some, um, he's been one of the most measured people in the world really? because we've begun to actually measure his proteome, his metabolome. I don't know if you want to mention that. So you, you test on yourself. Yeah, we do. Okay. So. I mean